All right, are we good for recording? Do I sound OK? You hear me in the back? Okay, awesome. All right, so this is cryptography 0 to 128 in 50 minutes, because it's a 50 minute time slot. All right, so our goal is to cram as much cryptography into 50 minutes as possible. I am not a mathy person, so I don't explain cryptography in terms of math, which if you're a mathy person may be a bad thing, but if I think for most of you that's going to be a good thing. Um, I work blue team, so I'm thinking practically about what does this mean to me, not, oh, theoretically an attacker could maybe, I want to know, can an attacker do it, or can't they, when can they, when can't they. So it's going to be very practical. And it's a subject like cryptography, and we're cramming it into 50 minutes, so this is going to be very fast-paced. So I am Benjamin Tice. I'm a Bloomsburg University alumni. I graduated with degrees in digital forensics and anthropology. I'm a huge nerd. Uh, I'm play of the games, and I run of the Linux. I have never shown up to a LAN party running anything except Linux, and I'm proud of that. I'm currently working for the blue team for one of our sponsors, G3 Technologies. Okay, so who deals with crypto? Well, if you do digital forensics, you deal with crypto. If you do IR, you deal with crypto. If you do red team, you deal with crypto. If you do blue team, you deal with crypto. If you connect to the internet on your smartphone, you do crypto. So this is relevant to everybody, although Baylor Talk seems pretty cool, so I wouldn't have blamed you if you hadn't gone to this. Topics we're going to cover, symmetric cryptography, stuff like AS where you have one key on both sides, both encrypt and decrypt. Asymmetric cryptography where one key encrypts and then the other one decrypts and then the other person also has a key pair, one of which encrypts, the other one decrypts. Hashes, um, who hears forensic background? Okay, so you should all be familiar with hashes. Um, Pseudorandom number generators, these are actually really important. Uh, as we're about to see, that's one of the four things you need to do cryptography is actual random numbers that practically can't be attacked. Um, cryptographic protocols, you can't really do much with just one algorithm with one primitive. You have to fit them together to do something meaningful. Um, and then side channel attacks. So when you're designing a cryptographic protocol, you're thinking, well, what can the attacker know? And generally, you're not thinking, well, the attacker can know how many milliseconds it takes me to do my calculations. That's a side channel. It's not, it's not attacking the crypto directly. It's attacking it indirectly. So four things that are necessary for strong cryptography. If you want to be successful, you need to have strong algorithms. Oddly enough, this is the easiest to get right, because I can just give you a list of use these algorithms, don't use these algorithms. Or if you want to break it down, you can use these algorithms in these circumstances, but not these circumstances. So this is the easiest part. You're going to configure SSH. You're going to configure SSL for a website. That, that's the easy part. Next one, a source of random numbers. When you're making a key to actually be able to do some kind of encryption or decryption, it has to be random so the attacker can't guess it. Um, and then we're constantly making nonces and initialization vectors that also generally have to have some entropy to them. Um, this is often messed up, but it's, it's pretty easily solvable. You just need to make sure that you do it and that you don't forget about it. Uh, next, correct implementations. Making an implementation of an algorithm that doesn't have side channels is really hard. Ensuring that your implementation of something uh, does what you think it does is hard. And lastly, robust protocols. Arguably, we've never done this. Okay? If you look at the history of a, of a complex protocol like TLS and SSL, which is what you use to you know, connect to Google, is HTTPS, yes, for secure, it means it's actually going through an encrypted tunnel. That's a complex protocol with like four different major steps and you know, four different kinds of cryptography going into it. Uh, it's had issue after issue after issue after issue. Why? Because it's big, ugly, and complex. Making a correct protocol is really, really hard. So we're going to start with symmetric cryptography. We're going to talk about block ciphers and stream ciphers. These are the requirements. For a symmetric cipher, if the attacker sees output, they are not allowed to know what the input is. This is the whole you know, kind of point of doing this, is that if I have a secret message that I need to tell Dr. Montante, I encrypt it. Dr. Montante also knows the secret key. I encrypt it with the key, hand it to him. I can also hand it to Rio, and Rio can't find out what the message was. And then Dr. Montante can find out what the message was because he also has the key. Okay. The other thing is that uh, you can't recover the key, because if you can recover the key, then you can then decrypt it as well. So this also a requirement. 
It's not always relevant, but there are situations where an attacker can actually hand a good guy data to be encrypted and then see the output. So in a situation like that, it's important that the attacker not be able to find the key from doing that, even if they can do it a bunch of times. Ciphers. Start, start, start easy. Route 13, it's a transposition cipher, rotates through the alphabet 13 forward. That sounds pretty secure, right? You know, fixed key. And um, RUT26 should be even more secure, right? Anybody? Somebody left. Uh, I only know one company that is ignorant enough to actually use RUT13 to try to protect something. I'll let you guess what company that is. <laughs> uh, so the, I bring this up for two reasons. One, it's a, a classic example of a, a simple cipher that's easy to wrap your head around. And the other one is it's a transposition cipher, which is going to come back up later when we talk about block ciphers. Um, the actual real parent cipher of all modern cryptography is the one-time pad. So in a one-time pad, you have a key that is the same length as your message. You take your low entropy message that's human readable, and your random, it has to be true random key, and you zor them together, and then you get gobbledygook out that looks random, and then if you take that same one-time pad again, you zor it across it again, you get your input out. We're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Um, Limitations here, the key size is equal to the message size. If I have a one gig file I want to, tran uh, want to transfer to you, I either then need to, through some out secure outside channel, give you a gig uh, one-time pad, or I had to have already given you a really big one-time pad that you're now using a chunk of it. So you're moving huge keys around, which is generally impractical. Um, and how it works is the ciphertext is the plain text Zord over a one-time pad. So, Let's talk about Zork. Who here knows Zork? Uh, if I give you a byte, two bytes, you can Zork them together. Who here has never heard of Zork before? OK, so a couple of our forensic students. That's, that's great. <laughs> I was very disappointed when my forensic math classes didn't cover this, but did cover like all kinds of other things that weren't important. So you take two bits at a time. If the bits are different, it's a, the output is a 1. If they're the same, the output is a 0. So 0, 0 is a 0. 1, 1 is a 0. 0, 1 is a 1, 1, 0 is a 1. Okay, it preserves the difference. The cool thing about this is that it's reversible. So look at the encrypt and decrypt, look at the column, we've got 1, 1, 0. Then we're going to secret key again, it's 0, 1, so the output is a 1. We've reversed it. And this works across the entire thing. So one time pad, really, really simple. Except when it's not. So when you reuse a one time pad, Zor eats a puppy. If you, it's one time, because you can only use it once. If you use that same key again, you're going to break the security of both of them. And the reason is because you can encrypt two, you can zor them together to remove the key, and you'll end up with a mash of the two messages. If you have more than two things that's, that's been encrypted with the same one-time pad, you can do even more fun stuff. This also allows you to guess plain text, and if you guess correctly, you'll decrypt the plain text for all of them and other stuff like that. So, example of this, first message, send cast, bitmap, zord against a one-time pad, get gobbledygook out. Different message, zord against one-time pad, get gobbledygook out. Zord the two encrypted messages together completely removes the encryption. But it's a jumble of the two messages, but the encryption's gone. Okay. And thank you to CryptoSmith for doing a really great visual representation of what this actually looks like. So, for a couple, we have a two issues with one-time pads, right? One of them is that we have this whole reuse issue where we have to generate a 100% unique pad for every message we want to encrypt. And the other one is that we have to move around these huge keys that are the same size as the message. Stream ciphers are a way to solve that. So the first thing we do is we don't exchange a one-time pad. We have a pseudo-random number generator that'll generate a pad based on a seed. And then we exchange seeds, we both generate the same pad, and then we can do a one-time pad with it. And Logically, this is how stream ciphers work, even though internally the, the pseudo-random number generator and the combination step are mixed together. This is still logically how you can think about them, which is important because you can still do the whole absorbing together thing. Brings to the other thing. They take a knot. We're going to talk about that more, but right now you just need to know that I can keep using the same seed, the same key, and just change my number used once. And as long as I never repeat that number and key together, uh, I will always be secure. 
is the nonce changes the output, but then it can be attacker known. So, block ciphers. Stream cipher is taken a bit, another bit, and encrypts them. It goes the next bit. You can also think of it as encrypting a stream at a time. Block ciphers takes a chunk, encrypts, takes the next chunk, encrypts, takes the next chunk, encrypts, takes the next chunk, encrypts. Um, generally, old school block ciphers were 64 bit blocks. Newer good ones are 128 bit blocks. We're not going to go over why that matters, but it does. So, uh, the most common construction for how a block cipher actually works is that it be uh, a substitution to cipher plus a transposition cipher. So, a substitution cipher is something really easy. Like, if I say Rio, no, really, I mean Ben in this email. And I send Dr. Montante an email, and every time he sees Rio, he goes, no, no, that actually that means Ben. That's a substitution cipher. And it turns out that if you combine a substitution cipher and a transposition cipher, like ROT13, but not rotating through an alphabet, rotating through all possible byte values. And that where that substitute, or uh, the rotation, or the transposition, depends on the key. You can actually have a publicly known substitution cipher, and if it's constructed correctly, you can substitute, rotate, mix the stuff around, substitute, mix the stuff around, substitute, mix the stuff around. And if you do that for enough rounds, it becomes infeasible to figure out what the input was or what the key was based on the output. And that's how DES works and that's how AES works. So, stream ciphers, IVs and nonces, one time pad, you can never reuse a key. Stream ciphers, at least good ones, take a second value. It's either an initialization vector, which means that it's unique and random, or a nonce, a number used once. A nonce doesn't need to be random. You may start it in a random place, but it can just be a counter. It just has to be unique. It can never be reused with the same key. Um, so, for example of how this has failed in practice, RC4 inside of web. Anybody have the Raytheon thingamajigs? Raytheon challenge cards? I know we have, somebody has them. Um, there's RC4 on there for you to try to break RC4. So, uh, RC4 has its own issues. But when they implemented it in WEP, it was during a time when the government uh, had restrictions on strong cryptography. You weren't allowed to have strong cryptography. So they restricted both the key size, but also the initialization vector. 24 bits means there's two to the 24 possibilities for that initialization vector, which means eventually you encrypt enough packets moving over your Wi-Fi channel, eventually it's going to repeat. And when it repeats, you'll have the same key and the same uh, nonce used. And you can then decrypt that content. Uh, even if you replaced RC4 with something stronger, something like AS Encounter Mode or Cha Cha 20, as long as the initialization vector was that short, you would always have these repeating nonsense. Yes. Okay. Um, if we had already exchanged a one-time pad, and I wanted to give you another one that was the same size, and the first one was trusted and secure, so we knew we were allowed to use it, I could then send you a second one using the first one, and then we could use the second one for something else. But we're still stuck with the same exact situation in terms of who has what keys. Right? We still have, we started with one usable key, and we ended with one usable key of whatever size. So we absolutely can, but there's not really a point. Does that make sense? Okay. We're going to get to the key exchange when we get out of symmetric crypto. Okay, so uh, stream ciphers that are, are good and that you should use, not RC4. Cha Cha 20, AS in counter mode, we're going to get to how AS, which is a block cipher, is also a stream cipher. Um, and the AS GCN, which is a counter mode that has authentication built into it instead of doing your own, uh, doing a message authentication code to check whether or not it was changed. So, block ciphers. One block at a time, as I said, crypt a block, pass it on, crypt a block, pass it on. Different block modes do different things. For example, ECB mode just grabs a chunk, encrypts it, passes it on. The problem with that is that the same input data will perform the same output data every single time, and we're going to see what that actually looks like in a minute. Um, good news about block ciphers, they resist the cold key reuse thing. So even if you don't have a nonce or initialization vector, you want one for a reason you're going to see. But if you don't have one, you can't do the whole Zoring stuff together to, to get stuff out. You can't do it. It resists that. 
Um, the technical term for the substitute rotate thing is permutation substitution. So the permutate is the change it, and then the substitute is map one symbol input to a different symbol output. Okay. Uh, this leads to an avalanche effect, which is also important for hashes, where if you change one bit of the input, every bit of the output changes. Uh, different block modes work in different ways. Okay. For example, counter mode takes some of the input, puts it back into the input, and then has a counter on it. So it turns AES or some other block cipher into a stream cipher. And it, once you do that, it behaves like a stream cipher. And then it has the, the zoring against itself issues and things like that. Good block modes use an initialization vector or nonce. Block ciphers to love and use. AES in CBC mode. Um, the, the other AES ones that are turned into stream ciphers are also good, but they're not block ciphers. Okay. <clears throat> Nobody's going to laugh? Nobody? Okay. So this is ECB versus CBC for that image. Anybody want to want to take a guess what the issue is with ECB mode? <laughs> yeah, you can still see it. <laughs> so the, the white blocks up in the corner get encrypted to a particular value that is glitchily being interpreted still as pixels. And everywhere that it's the same white pixel value, it's the same kind of ugly looking black pixel value on the outside. And then every other place that's the same exact pixel value turns into the same exact bit value that is then being still interpreted. So you still see the shape. What may be an even better example is this. Tux, the Lingus Penguin. This is a very, very, this is a version of a very famous one because the using Tux, the Linus mascot as an example of ECB mode is kind of a tradition now. But, uh, I don't know if you can see it, but you can still see the individual, like, chunk of two pixels or whatever it is that's one block worth of data. So. All right. Questions on symmetric crypto? Gregory first. Um, so to a security professional, ECB is a joke. The problem is that NIST, when they made the standard, didn't actually test their block modes. So they came up with like six or eight different block modes, and you only really want to use one of them. <laughs> Most of them are fine. ECB is really not. Yeah, so the reason why I used images in that example is because the human eye can see the issues with ECB mode. The same issue exists no matter what your data is. If it's any kind of predictable structured data, the structure will be preserved at a, you can think of it as a resolution of whatever your block size is. So the, the issue exists regardless of what you're doing, but pictures, bitmaps particularly, are really nice because you can see the issue. Um, in terms of performance, I don't actually know if there's a, a big performance difference. I think stream ciphers may be slightly faster, in general. There seems to be a mild preference for using stream ciphers these days. Um, this partially because we prefer authenticated encryption. Uh, so ChaCha20 actually has a message authentication code that it uses. ASGCN uses the Galios counter mode message authentication code. Um, all the ones that they made it where it's the authentication, the basically it's a signed hash of the stuff, so you know that it wasn't tampered with. Uh, for the ones that it's built in where that's high performance, the ones where we've done that are stream ciphers, and that's part of why they prefer them. Ultimately, in terms of security, you can have a completely secure block cipher or a completely secure stream cipher. And my understanding is the biggest impact on performance, barring weird things with where you're getting your data, is what the algorithm you use is. Does that answer your question? Any other questions before we move on? OK. That was symmetric. This is asymmetric. We have two keys per person, or t per people talking, right? So requirements. Given a public key, the attacker must not be able to find the private key. So 
I have a public key, I give it to Dr. Montante, he has a public key, he gives it to me, he's allowed to give it to all of you as well, it's public. But if Rio, evil Rio, wants to try to find one of our private keys, he shouldn't be able to from knowing our public key. Next, given a ciphertext, an attacker must not be able to recover the plaintext. Same basic encryption. If it's encrypted, you can't decrypt it. Next, given a ciphertext and a public key for the private key that did the encryption, you also can't find the plaintext or the private key, right? Because you're going to have more information and you have to worry more about data leakage. And again, given the ability to have data encrypted by the private key, the attacker must not be able to recover the private key. There are many situations where an attacker it's not all the time, but in live protocols, where an attacker can give you a good guy data to have it encrypted and then they can see the output. So if that happens, it's important that they not be able to use that to recover the, the private key. Okay, so asymmetric crypto, aka public key cryptography, because it requires a public key and a private key. It's often called public key cryptography. Every person generates a key pair. The public key encrypts and the private key decrypts. But if you encrypt with the private key, you encrypt or you decrypt with the public key. So we can use this as a secure messaging protocol, right? Dr. Montante and I know, know each other's public keys. I have a message, I encrypt it, I hand it to Dr. Montante, I also hand it to Rio. Rio doesn't know Dr. Montante's private key, so he can't decrypt it. Dr. Montante does. So I know the only person that can possibly decrypt the message is the intended recipient. Um, now, on the flip side, how does Dr. Montante know it was me that sent him the message? Well, if I take a hash of the message and then I encrypt it with my private key, then my public key will be able to decrypt that. But it's not a secret, it's just a hash. But by doing that, I've proven, I've signed it in such a way that nobody else could possibly have tampered with the message. So then Dr. Montante gets it, calculates the hash, he decrypts using my public key, the signed hash, and voila. Hash is the same. He knows it was for me. Um, uh, Four-way handshake for what? For Wi-Fi? So um, I believe like TLS uses a three-way handshake and it's doing this. The one that I know of that's four is Wi-Fi for uh, shared keys. No, a little different. But yes, there is a back and forth that goes on and we're gonna talk about that next. <laughs> uh, so Rio had mentioned, well, how do, how do we get keys back and forth? Like, you know, with a one-time pad or with something else? Well, the answer is I can encrypt a key with Dr. Montante's public key, and then I know only he has that key, and then we now have exchanged a key. And practically, if we were actually going to do something like encrypt an email, that's how we would do it. Is the body of the email would be encrypted with something like AES, and then I would give him that AES key using public key encryption. The reason is because public key encryption really only works on messages smaller than the key size. Um, the other, so the, the simple option is to just use encryption like I just described. A better thing to do is do little fancy mathematics where I know Dr. Montante's public key and he knows my public key. Then we can exchange back and forth a couple of uh, nonce values and we can actually uh, come to an agreement on a key. And Rio can watch everything going back on the forth on the network. And he can know both of our public keys and he still can't figure out what key we agreed on. And this is based on the same mathematics as so RSA, like the encryption, or in the terms of elliptical curve, based on the same math as elliptical curve, other stuff. Um, then th this exchange is called Diffie-Hellman key exchange or Diffie-Hellman key agreement. And that's how practically how two people can exchange a key. Every time you go to a website, there's this whole verification of the website's certificate, which I'm about to talk about. And then you've picked a, a a key, and then you do Diffie-Hellman, some variation of Diffie-Hellman to exchange a key, and then in, within your TLS connection, then all your data is encrypted with that symmetric key. Uh, so certificates is, okay, so Dr. Montante wants to know a message is from me, and he knows it's from a particular key. How does he know that's my key? 
Well, certificates are a, a public statement of this is who I am, so it's got data about you. Practically, they have like your business, your address, uh, fully qualified domain name, and email, a bunch of stuff, most of which is very silly. Um, and then the public key, and then it's signed. So again, we have hash and then encrypted with a private key of some trusted third party or some equivalent signature algorithm. So that then, I don't know who this person is, but I see that their, sign, their certificate is signed by that person. I don't know who they are, but I see their certificate is signed by that person. You can chain this back up until you find somebody that I trust. And if I don't find anybody I trust, I don't trust that certificate. This is how, this is called public key infrastructure. It is a royal pain to manage the record. Uh, and this is how, when you go to a website, you know that Google.com is actually Google.com, is that you connect, your browser grabs a certificate, it looks who that certificate is signed by, and then it follows the chain up, and then it checks whether or not it trusts the top of that list. Uh, same thing if you, like, you know, you're on Windows, and you're going to install something, it says, you know, from Oracle Corporation. Well, the reason it knows it's from Oracle is because it, that binary you're installing was signed with Oracle's with a private key associated with Oracle's certificate, and you can then verify it. Okay, so uh, algorithms to know and use carefully. You may have noticed there are a couple more requirements in terms of what these need to do to be secure. That's because these are more fragile than symmetric algorithms. So it's actually easier to, to screw up asymmetric stuff. Use carefully, RSA is still okay. You have to be careful with what it's being used for, but you can still use it okay and productively. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, there's a version called ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, that's what the E stands for. Prefer that one. It means you're keeping a key, the same key for like two minutes, something like that, instead of using the same key for, the, for forever. Uh, so we have the Edwards Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. So there's a different one that's not based on Edwards Curve, that's ECDSA, Elliptical Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. Uh, that one's curves are junk. Uh, you can't write a constant time implementation, which we're going to talk about why that matters later. Edwards Curve 1 doesn't have that issue. It's constant time. They also made it so you don't need a nonce to do the signature because it's using a hash to generate the nonce value. So that's cool. And then elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, which is elliptical, which is Diffie-Hellman, but based on elliptical curves. So RSA is basically multiply as an encryption function. Elliptical curves are multiply across a weird graph as an encryption function. So that's the, that's the difference. A lot of people like elliptical curves because they're stronger for the same key size and they're still fast to compute and stuff. But you can do Diffie-Hellman using that mathematics as a basis and you still want the ephemeral version. So, questions about asymmetric cryptography? Yeah. You never have to make them, your browser deals with that for you. And the reason for that is because uh, websites don't verify users. Users only need to verify the website. So it doesn't really matter what your browser does. It can generate a new one every day, or a new one every connection, or whatever it wants. My guess is for performance reasons they probably don't go that far, but I don't actually know. But it's because you're only verifying the website that your browser can do more or less whatever it wants. Um, for performance reasons, there's a lot of caching that goes on, but if it doesn't have the one, then yes, it will have to go out and pull the next one. Or get it from the website itself. You can actually have your website set up to not only provide its own certificate, but also the one that signed it and potentially the entire chain. So it has to get it from somewhere, and it doesn't really matter where it gets it because it's cryptographically uh, guaranteed whether it's correct. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? I was expecting lots of questions on asymmetric. Wow. Okay. Hashes. Know them, love them, use them all the time. Uh, so a hash is an algorithm that takes a variable-sized input and produces a fixed-size output. I can, be, I can do a blank hash. You can do a hash of nothing, and it'll produce a hash. You can do a hash of a few bits. You can do a hash of a few bytes. You can do a hash of a few gigs. You can do a hash of a uh, terabyte. You do a hash of a petabyte. It, the hash output is always going to be the same fixed number of bits out. Doesn't matter how much data you shove through it. 
Uh, the other thing is um, a one-bit change in the input will produce a dramatic change in the output. The same avalanche thing that we talked about with block ciphers. It's very, very important to hashes. Um, has to be one way. Given an output, the attacker must not be able to find an input. Anybody go to the, to the hash reversal talk yesterday? Okay, one person. He did a really good job of explaining hash functions uh, and all of that stuff. So go on irongeek.com and go watch that talk because it was awesome. Um, given an input and output, must not be able, the attacker must not be able to find a second input with the same output. Think certificate, right? Rio has, evil Rio has my public key and my certificate. My certificate is my public key, my information about me, a, a hash of that, and then the hash is signed. If he can, so he knows the input and the output of the hash function. If he can find a different public key, one that he generates, that'll hash to the same thing, he can forge a certificate that looks real, that verifies, you do the signature verification, it verifies as being mine, but actually it's his. This is why getting away from SHA-1 is so important, because if you're going to a website, SHA-1 collisions mean somebody can man in the middle of as well as VPN connections and everything else that uses this. Okay. So uh, this is called collision resistance, that you can't find another input that'll have the same output. So hashes no one love, SHA-3, Blake-2, Skyne, SHA-256, and SHA-512. These are all good. The bigger SHA-2s have been around for a while. Uh, they're still solid. Um, SHA-3, Blake-2, and Skyne are all from the SHA-3 competition. Uh, Kekek is the algorithm that won and became SHA-3, but the other two finalists were also really strong, and there are a lot of people that prefer Blake-2 over SHA-3. Hashes to burn and salt the earth, MD5 and SHA-1. SHA-1 is expensive to find a collision, but governments can do it. Companies can probably do it as well. MD5 is trivial. You can generate a collision on your laptop in seconds, which means that for forensics, you can't trust MD5. For example, National Software Reference Library is a list of hashes of known good stuff that you can ignore in a forensic investigation. Pretty sure it's distributed as MD5. They may have improved that now. I could have a malicious file that I find a collision for something that's in the NSRL, and then voila, it's being emitted from your forensic investigation because you trusted MD5. Uh, if you absolutely have to use MD5 to compare to somebody else's MD5 hash, that's fine. Just make sure that you have some hash that's a cryptographically secure one. We're also going to talk about password hashing. I know we had a, a password hash reversal talk yesterday. Uh, I've incorporated it into my talk. So if you're going to store a password, you do want to hash the password. So how this works is I have an, I'm a website in my database. I have a hash for a certain user. Somebody logs on claiming to be that user. They hand me a string that's their password. I hash it and compare the hash. The hash is the same, the string inputs were the same, the person knows the password. So what type of uh, hash do we want to use? Well, we don't want to use the same hash as we use for something else. You need something specifically designed for passwords or for key derivation, that key derivation, because it's really the same thing. So you want something that's salted and iterated. So a salt is a value that can be known by the attacker when they steal the hash but that you don't want them to know before that. And it's stored with the hash in plain text, is just there, and it's a second input to the hashing algorithm that'll change the output. Think of this as kind of like the nonce when we're doing encryption in the IV. It's something that can be known. The goal of a salt is to prevent pre-computation attacks, that the attacker only finds out the salt value once they've actually stolen the hash. So they can, couldn't have done any work to speed things up before they steal the hash. So uh, traditionally, this would be a rainbow table. It's an optimized space optimization on a lookup table where the attacker just has a list of fancy list. Again, talk yesterday, explained this much better than I ever could, of what input maps to what output. And so they see the output, and they just look it up in the dictionary. It's just a dictionary lookup to crack your password. That's a pre-computation attack. To do something like that against a uh, hash that has a salt is now exponentially larger, because you have to then calculate every input multiplied by every salt value. Um, cool talk yesterday, the bloom reversal technique also defeated. Bloom reversal is a whole lot faster than rainbow tables, but it's also exponentially larger if it's salted. 
Um, and then iterated hashes are slow. So when you're practically, because hash functions can't be reversed, you have to guess inputs to see if the output is correct. As an attacker, that's what you have to do. Um, so the slower the hash function is, the le uh, longer it takes an attacker. If you can get a hash function, you increase the work factor until it's taking like 15 milliseconds. That is going to take the attacker forever. So next, which what algorithms do you want to use? Argon2, Scrypt, and Bcrypt in that order. So one of the issues here is that the attackers generally have better, nicer, more specialized hardware than the good guys do. A uh, great one is uh, GPUs, right? If you're going to do Bitcoin mining, is basically this type of operation. Uh, hash, you know, password cracking. You're going to use a GPU. That means the attacker is going to be cracking a lot faster than you're using it. So something that'll crush your website, the attacker can blaze through. You want to even that imbalance between attacker and defender, and you do that by choosing a hash function, a password hashing algorithm that is also hard for attackers. For example, bcrypt doesn't run very fast on GPUs. So even though you can parallelize it on the GPU, it's still running so slow that you would be better off with CPU, as opposed to something like SHA-256 crypt or PBKDF2 that runs like 100 times faster on a GPU than it does on a CPU. Right? Uh, Argon2 and Scrypt gain this equalizing force by being memory hard. Uh, there's a time memory trade-off. The more memory attacker throws at it, the faster it runs. If you're memory constrained, it's going to run really slow. This means that even if an attacker builds like a super customized ASIC or FPGA board, that that board, all it does is calculate that hash, they're still going to have to stick a big RAM module on it. And RAM is expensive. So this is going to drive up the prices. It's going to keep things equal between attacker and defender. If you have to be standardized, you have to use something that is standard, use PBKDF2, but turn on the pepper feature. PBKDF2, as I mentioned, accelerates on GPU and everything else. It doesn't have this equalizing factor, which is why you should exceed this standard and use something else. But if you have to be standardized, use PBKDF2 and then use the pepper feature. The pepper feature is actually a, an encryption key that encrypts the passwords as well. So that, and then you store it someplace else other than where your passwords are. So then you've increased the attacker's work. This isn't foolproof because if the attacker is completely in your system, they can steal that as well. Doing something that's slow protects you no matter what the attack does. Things not to do. Don't store the passwords in plain text. Hopefully this crowd that makes intuitive sense to. Uh, uh, don't, don't encrypt them. Being, having, having it be reversible is bad. Um, particularly because you're going to have to have the key around someplace to then be able to check candidate passwords you're comparing. Um, so that's not what we want. We want the one-way function of the hash that's not reversible. Um, and then don't store them as straight MD5 or straight anything else. It needs to be salted and iterated. Otherwise, rainbow tables and the really crazy stuff that the noblest guys were talking about yesterday will work. And you can crack like really crazy passwords in like 15 minutes. All right. Questions about hashing and password storage in the back. Yeah, you can think of them as being the same thing. It's, it's the exact same idea in that by having something that's going to be different per every person, we're you know, adding uniqueness. So another issue, if you don't have assault, um, if both I and Rio have the same password, we're going to have the same salt. And that'll save somebody time and going, oh, these two people use the same password. If you have the salt, it's different, and it prevents pre-computation. I think you were next. Uh, isn't, isn't that what's used in bcrypt? We'll have to double check that, but I believe that the, the magic, the special sauce that makes bcrypt work is that it has Blowfish's really expensive key setup step, and that's the part that's really slow on GPU. So we can double check that. Uh, depends on how fast you want to crack it. Practically, it still runs fairly fast on a GPU with a decent amount of memory. But the thing is, it's a time memory trade-off. The more RAM you give the algorithm, the faster you can get it to run. The less RAM you have, the slower it runs. 
So it's not like you, you need a certain amount, it's, the, it's a trade-off. The more you give it, the faster you can crack it. Does that make sense? Uh, one, one terabyte of memory is going to be oodles and oodles and oodles of money. Yeah. Like RAM, RAM gets exponentially expensive the more you have. So if you're going to try to crack a bunch of these things, it's going to be very, very expensive. No, no, I can't even imagine that. Uh, the other cool thing about uh, like Argon2 and S-Script is that they are also intended to be parallelized, so you can actually force the attacker to use a certain number of threads to efficiently calculate your stuff. So if you're on like a 16-thread uh, Xeon, you optimize it for that number, and then that's going to eat up that many channels in the attacker, attacker system. We had in the back? No, we needed to have SHA-1 SHA be gone now, if not sooner, if not a few years ago. So the research paper that Google took and ran with, I forget who they were doing the research side by side with, it's been known for years that you will be able to find collisions in SHA-1. It's just that nobody had proven it. And to put the nail in SHA-1's coffin, Google actually came out, they got the supercomputer, they did it, and they calculated a SHA-1 collision. Uh, 2020 is too late, today is too late. We needed to have this stuff gone years ago. Um, I, it's actually very likely that China has been intercepting VPN traffic by forging certificates, which either means they broke RSA or they broke SHA-1. So this, this is an issue and it needed to have been solved a long time ago. So you store it in the database with the password. So when, when a person creates a user account, you randomly generate them a salt, preferably through a good source of randomness, which I, might be the next thing we talk about. Uh, and then it just gets stored in the database. If you look in the, the etz shadow file on Linux, you're actually going to see a little number that tells you, hey, this is what version of hashing algorithm we have. You're going to see a salt value, a separator, and then the hash. Right? And that's exactly how you would store it in a database for users logging in or anything else. You just generate the salt and you store it with their password. Does that make sense for you? So the whole point is that you want to prevent pre-computation. Username is publicly known long before uh, that. So there are systems that have done that, but it's not a good idea. It's much better to, uh, to use it be random. In particular, uh, device vendors also did that for like Wi-Fi and other things like that, for theirs, where it was the vendor name that was the salt. And that was really bad, which is why on a lot of like routers and stuff, you'll like to see vendor name dash something, 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 gobbledygook, because they're still using that as the salt, but now they've changed it so their name is different. Great, great. Uh, I have no idea. So it's been known for quite a few years that SHA-1 was having problems, and that's why they put up SHA-3, when they started the SHA-3 competition, because they thought that SHA-2 would be broken as well. But as far as I know, nobody's found any, any like, cracks in SHA-2 that are going to make it look like it's going to be broken in a few years. SHA-1, we knew it was going to be broken. SHA-2, it's not looking like it's going to be broken quickly. So there, there's, I don't have data to, to guess, probably not in the next few years. Uh, right, so, so collision resistance is not a requirement of a password hashing function. You don't care whether or not there are collisions. You care about that for certificates and file verification. So you can have a super crazy, you know, SHA-2048 that's based on SHA-3 and is super powerful. It's still not a good way to store a password because it's not salted and it's not iterated. And it'll accelerate really fast on a GPU. Does that make sense? So you actually want to use a whole, whole different set of requirements and all different things you're looking for when you're storing a password compared to comparing two files to prove they're the same.
No, you can still you can still run paralyzes very very well on a GPU. Not, you're not using anywhere near enough memory. You want to use a few megs per require at least a couple megs per uh, per hash when you're doing that calculation. So that's what you can do with that script in Argon too. Does that make sense? Any other questions before I move on? Okay. And I was right. Pseudorandom number generators are next. So the requirements for a cryptographically secure pseudorandom number generator. Every programming language out there has some kind of RAND function or a random object that will give you random numbers. They are not cryptographically secure. In fact, if you're... Do we have any red team people here? That's depressing. Um, <laughs> So do we have any other blue team people in here? OK, there we go. Uh, so if you're, say, generating a, a user token or a session cookie or a password reset code or anything else like that using an off-the-shelf RAND function from PHP, JavaScript, Java, C, C++, whatever, by seeing one, maybe two of those outputs, an attacker can recover the internal state of the pseudorandom number generator and figure out every number it will ever generate, which means they can figure out the next one that's going to be generated. Uh, I've seen demonstrations where people actually reset their own password, find that, and then reset somebody else's password they don't have the email for, but then they know what the code is going to be. So you don't want to use a regular pseudorandom number generator. You want to use a cryptographically secure one. So the requirements. Given the output, the attacker must not be able to predict the seed. This seed value is just like a key. Okay? It has to be a secret. The attacker knows that they can generate the entire string. And then, two, the, given the output, the attacker must not be able to figure out the next thing for the reason I just told you, as well as not the previous things. So if we do something like generate a nonce value that's going to be publicly known, and then we generate a key that's going to be publicly known, or that has to be a secret, it's really, really important the attacker not be able to figure out what the next thing to be generated will be, or vice versa. So these are actually really easy to build. Uh, if you have a secure hash function, you just need a seed and a counter. And then that counter is a number used once. It's never going to be repeated, which means you're going to have unique values output from the hash function. Really easy. Um, most things that do hash-based pseudorandom number generators are shoving way more data into them because they're also using it as an entropy collector. But given a secure stream cipher, you can make a PRNG out of it by just having it encrypt zeros. Uh, I mentioned before that logically they are a pseudorandom number generator. If it's secure as a stream cipher, it's equally secure as a pseudorandom number generator and vice versa. Practically, most cryptographically secure random number generators are made out of stream ciphers, either cha cha 20 or AS in counter mode. Which brings us to, given a secure block cipher, you can run it in a block mode that turns it into a stream cipher, and voila, you have a stream cipher in crypto zeros, you've got random numbers. So if these are easy to build, how do they fail? As I mentioned before, number one reason, people don't use them. Right? They're in their PHP app, and they're just like, you know, rand. Same thing with C, same thing with everything else. If you don't use it, you've got problems. Uh, the other one is you need entropy in that seed. Okay? So we're, we're cheating here. We're not actually generating. I'm going to output you know, a 256-bit key, and I'm, then I'm going to generate 10 more of them, or 100 more of them, or I'm going to be generating random no nonces for hundreds of connections on my system over the next couple of days. Uh, I don't have you know, a couple gigs of random data to pull those out of. We're cheating. All we have is a short little seed, which means that to take that seed and expand it to something big, you need to make sure that there's actually some entropy in the seed. What is entropy? Technically, it's randomness from the statistical or mathematical sense. Practically, entropy is stuff an attacker cannot possibly know. If there's no way the attacker can ever find it out, that's an acceptable source of randomness. Uh, so how Linux does this is hard drive head timing jitter. There's just... Um, the physical system of a hard drive where it's got the platter and the head moving back over it to read data, that's not predictable. There's always going to be a little bit difference between each head and then as it wears down and other things like that. Uh, the other one is mouse and keyboard events. Oh, we're not actually good at generating randomness, but if you're recording every little twitch of our mouse and the tiny timing differences between keystrokes, that's, that's good enough. The tagger's not going to be able to recover that. Um, embedded systems. And virtual systems also ha often have issues with this. If you have a headless server, no user input with an SSD, there goes all your entropy. Okay. Uh, same thing with embedded systems, Raspberry Pis, other things, things like that. 
on virtual machines, it's not touching any actual hardware. And it probably doesn't have user interaction if we're talking to the enterprise. It's probably a server with no user interaction. So again, a situation where maybe there could be failure. <coughs> And of course, there are the pseudo-random number generators that never had entropy in the first place. I have yet to see somebody do a new reverse engineering of Windows Script Gen Random, but the last one was of Windows 2000, and they didn't have an entropy source. They had a, the, everything in the kitchen sink in terms of the internal state of the machine, machine name, the process block, a bunch of other things, and then the time to act as a nonce, so it would never output the same thing twice. Actu no actual or very little actual entropy going into the outputs. Which means if an attacker gets on your system, they can find that stuff out. So, Okay. Uh, another way they can fail is it can have a backdoor in it. So our government, specifically the NSA, was so happy as to create us a backdoor pseudorandom number generator, hand that to NIST. NIST is the standardized it. People started putting it in libraries. Thank goodness they didn't put it as the default random number generator in too many of them. Juniper Systems, who produces net screen routers, thankfully they're not a, they're not a sponsor, so I can, I can pick on them. Uh, they changed a whole bunch of stuff in how they deal with random numbers to turn this backdoored pseudo random number generator into a functioning backdoor for their VPN connections. And it, it's like a list of like six different things they had to change to get it working. But at the end of the day, they generate a nonce before the key for that connection. The attacker sees the nonce. It's a bigger nonce. It's big enough that you can do optimizations on it. And the attacker takes that and generate the next thing. This is based on elliptical curve cryptography, which should seem a bit odd, right? Because elliptical curves are used for asymmetric cryptography, where you have secret values that are transforming other values. And that's exactly how this works, where there's a secret value that will transform outputs to the next output. And if you know that secret, then you can see any output from the pseudorandom number generator, and you can predict the next one. So I see the nonce, predict the next thing, that's going to be the key. So that's how this works. Uh, thankfully, well, so it's, it's bad news. Foreign intelligence, probably. Somebody managed to break into Juniper systems, changed the elliptical curve they were using. That changes the secret key. Juniper and whoever, whatever three-letter agency, probably the NSA, told them to put it in no longer had access to the back door, somebody else did. Juniper's a pretty big name when it comes to government contractors, business, etc. Juniper went, oh crap, somebody else is using our back door, we need to tell people. So they switched it back, and then somebody was like, well, what's going on here? And then they figured out, oh no, Juniper had put the back door in years ago. So they finally removed it. Questions about entropy, randomness, random numbers, backdoor PRNGs, why you should care. Yeah. So, um, so RSA and elliptical curves are all based on mathematics involving primes and multiplications and stuff like that. No, I have no idea. <laughs> so th that's the thing. I know primes are important, but I have yet to find an actual cryptographer who can explain to me why they matter, why it has to be prime, or anything else like that. Mm -hmm. So it, and if it wasn't a prime, it would be easier to factor? OK. Do you know if that holds true for the problems in elliptical curve cryptography? My guess is that it does, because that's also a, like, you can do it one way, but it's hard to put it back thing. So, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? How am I doing on time? I'm pretty much out of time. That's always exciting. Ah, protocols. Protocols are bad. The more complicated a protocol, hey, I actually think that's a slide. The more complicated a protocol, the more vulnerable it is. I was going to go through examples of every single step of TLS and SSL can be vulnerable, but I'm going to skip that. Okay. And we have side channel attacks. When you're doing stuff, you can leak data about the key. This falls into one of two categories. Either the attacker can guess something directly, for example, guessing a password based on how long it takes to do the string comparison. Or where they're, what they're looking at, like power, or the cache in the CPU, or something else like that. Uh, you can actually figure out what some of the bits of the key are. So side channels are an issue. Um, why you don't want to use NIST elliptical curves for a lot of stuff is because NIST elliptical curves, you can't have a constant time implementation. 
So how long the signature function takes actually leaks information about the key. And it's really, really hard, almost impossible to write an implementation that that's not true for. OK, recap. We had to skip almost all of cryptographic protocols. I apologize, but you now know all of the primitives that go into a protocol like that. Uh, the reason we need correct implementations is largely because of side channel attacks. Even if you have a logically correct implementation, it can still have issues because it can leak data. And we talked about cryptographic primitives. So, uh, symmetric, like AES, asymmetric, like RSA, and elliptical curve Diffie-Hellman, hashes, and pseudorandom number generators. Quick, before I pass this over to the next person, do we have any questions, concerns, worries, fears, dreams, aspirations, or snide remarks? Very great. Uh, so uh, it's, it's elliptical curve, digital signature algorithm is the thing that's particularly vulnerable to that. And the reason is to implement the mathematics for that curve, you have to have like a bunch of different stuff depending on what it does. So there's a whole bunch of conditional branch logic, and depending on what stuff it is you're signing, it'll go to a different branch in the code. And that's, uh, that's required for creating a practical implementation of that. That's why. So it's maybe you can do it, but it's really, really hard.